Today, I'm joined by Samantha Irby, the New York Times bestselling author of Meaty, We Are Never Meeting in Real Life. And as of today, wow, no, thank you. Sam, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me in this virtual space. It's nice to half meet you, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I'm glad you're not really meeting me because I didn't really get dressed for this. Th this is the first time I put on a nice shirt in a while, so or maybe just yeah. a shirt. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I have no concept of time or clothing anymore. Yeah, the <laughs> days have no shape. No, I don't know what day it is or what I'm doing. Uh, I think your book came out today, actually. <sighs> wow. I um, do I don't get to see it anywhere. I guess when people start tagging me on Instagram, I'll know it's real. There you go. Well, we're going to start this event with a, a reading from your new book. And from there, we're going to get into a little conversation uh, okay, on cool. the book and more. So why don't you take it away, Sam? Okay. I'm going to read the first piece in the book. I know they're called essays, but essay feels like too smart for what I do. Anyway, this first one is called Into the Gross. I live for a glamorous lifestyle blog featuring some gorgeous ingenue with piles of secret wealth that she never divulges to the unsuspecting slobs on the other side of the screen. How does she afford $300 eye cream if her job is listed as freelance editor? And why is it tossed so casually on her nightstand like she wouldn't cry if she lost it? I want to admire her floating through a bright and clean apartment in photos so beautiful and overexposed that it hurts your ugly, regular person eyes to look at them as she describes the minutia of her daily routines, but all the cat dander clouding my eyes makes it difficult. Maybe I should try alkaline water, I murmur to myself as I squint through the unidentifiable goo dried on my phone screen, making a mental note up what adaptogens are after I search for the cheapest gratitude journal on Amazon. Wow, she got that skin from vitamins, I sigh. Sip of a warm grape crush I opened either three hours or three days ago. I subscribe to so many of these blogs and newsletters, I can't even tell them apart. Partly I'm curious about the stuff people buy, Oh, I am not curious, I'm actually obsessed, and if I pee at your house, I will make note of the hand soap you use and immediately copy you if it's fancier than mine, but in an admiring way, not a single white female way, I promise. But mostly it's just straight up awe because I love stuff so fucking much, and I wanna know how people get to be so pretty and chic. I buy a lot of face washes from targeted Instagram ads, but no one gives a shit about what I use, probably because I have chin whiskers. Plus, if a hip photographer with cool shoes came to my home, the cats would definitely bite her, and we don't have a single glamorous white wall to use as a backdrop. Even if we did, would anyone be interested in pictures of my stacks of discounted K-Beauty face masks from Big Lots? No. Still, being featured on a stylish lifestyle blog is my biggest secret dream, and because I'm too disgusting to ever be asked in real life, I want to tell you how mine would go. I like to wake up naturally, gripped by a heart-pounding panic as the sun slices through my eyelids at noon when it is perfectly aligned with my bedroom windows. I wince against the sun's blinding rays, a sick feeling spreading through me. It dawns on me that I have already wasted an entire day, again. I grimace loudly as I slide off the bed and feel around blindly with my toes for the orthopedic flip-flops I keep close enough to find without my glasses on. Sure, I could probably shuffle to the bathroom gripping every flat surface I come into contact with along the way, but who are we kidding? I desperately need the arch support. I have to pee since I've been horizontal for several hours, and all the fluid on my legs has pulled backward, upward, what is physiology, into my bladder. Then I grope through all the bottles in the medicine cabinet until I find one that feels like a leave. I get the liquid gel capsules because they look more sciency and futuristic, and after fumbling with the arthritis cap, I get one lodged in my esophagus despite the fact 
that I've dislocated my neck, desperately lapping at lukewarm faucet water as it slips through my cupped fingers to wash it down. It crosses my mind that I should just stagger back to my room and get in bed and try again tomorrow, but guilt. So I return to the toilet instead. My kegel muscles no longer hold urine in like they used to and will myself to just turn the shower on. Turn it on. Just turn it on. You can do it. Turn it on. I risk shattering my phone in the sink trying to cue up a podcast, which I listen to because they're both which I listen to because they're popular and entertaining. But also, if I turn the volume all the way up, it helps to drown out the noise of my washing. I consider doing a single one of the approximately 96 beauty treatments littering the vanity and erupting out of the plastic shoe boxes I hide them from my wife in, but I already drank a tablespoon of water, so what else is there even to do? In the shower, I use a big block of Irish spring, and because I'm black, I was raised to always use a washcloth no matter what, what, so I do. I also scrub my scalp vigorously with anti-dandruff shampoo, which is a thing beautiful people never have to use. Just once, I want to read one of these profiles where a slender, shiny-toothed model is like, hey, bitch, I have psoriasis while aggressively slathering tea gel into her roots. I don't shave my armpits or legs, but somehow I still take an inordinately inordinately long time to get clean. After my shower, I use Neutrogena body oil because you can get a giant bottle super cheap at Target and it smells like rich people. My towel smells like mildew, but I ignore it. Yoga, meditation, and calming morning rituals are for people who actually wake up in the morning. So instead, I skip all that and launch into my day, gathering everything I brought up to bed last night when I was pretending I might work instead of watching TV. I load it all into the pink bag I schlep with me from room to room because, listen, I'm not walking back up these stairs until nighttime. I wear the same thing pretty much every day a tucked in t shirt high-waisted sloth pants, and a sweatshirt. Despite my, <laughs> despite my having what is obviously an impossibly flashy and lavish lifestyle, I regret to inform you that I have no sponsors. Breakfast was over four hours ago, so I start with lunch. I once read one of these profiles where the woman featured talked about alkalizing her body at the start of the day with lemon water, And I am being 100% sincere when I say that sentences like that fucking mystify me. What does that mean? How did she learn those words? I go to the doctor every other day and never has one of them told me about alkalization. Alkalining? Alkalinization? The need to be alkalized. I'm in awe of people who talk like that with a straight face. And let me tell you, the shit stuck. So now I start my morning, I mean afternoon, by drinking some room temperature water from the pitcher on the counter with a few slices of Meyer lemon from those little bags of them you can get at Trader Joe's. It has done absolutely nothing for me, from what I can tell. But later on, when I eat an entire jalapeno and pepperoni pizza and feel bad about it, I can think to myself, Bitch, remember when you alkalized and feel clean. We live up the street from a middle school and children are already on their way home for fuck's sake. So I don't feel bad having six Diet Cokes in a row. I'll finish my water, but like, I don't ever want to be too hydrated. All these magazines tell you how you should really be, how you should really be drinking your weight in water every day. And all these movie stars would have you believe their skin glows because of that water bottle they're carrying around. And I believe them, but also, why doesn't anyone ever talk about how much peeing you will have to do? I no longer have a pelvic floor, Jennifer Aniston. I cannot just be gulping down smart water with reckless abandon. After consuming all the liquids I'm going to for the entire day, I settle down to work which I'm really going to do as soon as I put on a little cream highlighter and blush that no one else is ever going to see. My work, 
I occasionally write jokes on the internet for free because I'm the last person on earth who still has a blog. Sometimes I have freelance projects, but there's nothing right now. No one is going to pay me to write another book about nothing for at least the next two years. Unfortunately, I don't have anything new or exciting to say online and absolutely zero paying scams. So my heart sinks, sinks as it dawns on me that I've gotten up and gotten dressed just to read what other people are saying on Twitter. This is the glamorous life of a writer. After feeling like a boring failure for a while, I pivot to watching TV. If I don't wanna feel like a total scumbag, I'll watch something on the iPad, which I can quickly disguise as work if, oh, I don't know, the mailman glances through the blinds while delivering my many boxes from Amazon Prime. Now would be a great time to snack on some quick pickled beans or fermented slaw, but I am a regular person. So I dig through the pantry to find half a bag of sourdough pretzels I remember leaving in there a week ago and a jar of creamy Jif. Some people would warn you that that's just eating one type of sugar smeared on top of another kind, and I would agree with them. I could really go for a fresh cold pressed juice, but I don't live in Brooklyn, so I settle for the next best thing another Diet Coke. Okay, so here's the part in the profile where the model meets up with an equally attractive non-model friend someplace cool. The reader is flooded with envy because she doesn't have one friends or two cool places to go. And the models are always like, oh, tra-la-la, I walked 17 blocks in these heels I'm posing in to meet up with my girl Monica at a vinyl only music shop to listen to some vintage hard bop records. And then we walked 23 more blocks to get affogados at this hidden gem that you can only enter through a portal. And after that, we went to Soul Cycle. I'm winded just reading that. My afternoons are always like, search through all my jacket pockets to find a half melted lip balm before catching the cat eating its own vomit off the kitchen rug. But since you're here taking my picture, I'm going to light this fancy candle from Diptyque, pretend it doesn't make me sneeze, and scroll through shit on my phone while trying to look pensive. My evening routine is pretty simple. My lady comes home from work and will opt for something light for dinner, maybe some sous vide chicken and fresh steamed vegetables from it, followed by one glass of wine and a single square of 70% dark chocolate consumed while fully clothed on a white couch in front of a tastefully sized television play foreign film. Wow, I'm sorry, let me try that again. My lady comes home and grimaces silently at the pile of mail I've left unopened on the table, simultaneously shrugging out of her coat while uncorking a bottle of white wine from Walgreens with her teeth. She gets into her pajamas and I scramble to boil water for pasta and throw whatever is in the vegetable crisper into a pan to make sauce. Then we eat in our sweatshirts in front of whatever soap opera is on while yelling at the cats to stop jumping up onto the stove. This lasts for at least 45 minutes before she is asleep, curled around her wine glass in the corner of the couch, and I try to finish her food as quietly as possible and change the channel to wrestling. At night, there are many soothing rituals I could perform. I could put on a pot of tea, or light some calming incense, or put on a collagen mask, or rub some moisturizing cream into my hands, but you know what? I don't live like that. I put all my stuff back in my bag, and I drag it upstairs. Then I clean the tank of my sleep machine with vinegar and take all my pills so I hopefully don't die during the night. And then I pretend I'm going to read, but instead I put the news on our bedroom television set and worry about the state of the world. At 11.30 or so, I remember that despite not having left the house all day, I'm still wearing a bunch of old makeup. So I get out of bed and use one of those time-saving cleansing wipes you have to use of to clean my face while I brush my teeth, which honestly, I wouldn't have done if I didn't also have to pee. There's a bunch of little oil droppers on my bedside table that would look really cute in a still life if they weren't next to toppled bottles of potassium supplements and industrial strength callus creams. But I sort through them and extract one rosehip oil from my face 
and want oregano oil for under my tongue. I use the rose hip so my skin continues to glow with the health and vitality of a newborn, despite my salt intake. And the oregano is a holdover from when I had thrush that I just keep taking because I haven't had thrush again since then. And also, why the fuck not? I roll some compression hose onto my legs to remind myself that I am sexy and change into pajamas that look exactly like the clothes I wore all day, which are folded atop the hamper because I will be wearing those same things again tomorrow. I watch Brian Williams and some reruns of Rachel Maddow and Chris Hayes and pretend I understand what is happening in the world. Then I set the sleep timer before burrowing beneath this TJ Maxx comforter that has been surprisingly durable, and I drift off to dream of adaptogens and other beneficial herbs, which I will never take. That was a selection of Wow, No Thank You by Samantha Irvy. Thank you, Samantha Irvy. Oh, thank you for allowing me to uh, be disgusting to a wide uh, audience of people. I feel like if there's like a selection of one of your books for someone who has not read you before and you want to say, mm -hmm. this is what, this is who I am. This is a great mm -hmm. example. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So many people are like, oh, <laughs> woman. I think no. they're shaking their heads right now. <laughs> yeah. um, they're like, oh, that's enough of that. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> it is also a fabulous essay for this moment in time. I remember a few years ago reading an essay you wrote called A Case for Remaining Indoors, oh, which um, let's just say it feels pretty prophetic now. <laughs> Uh, how are how are you doing in all of this? Actually, I mean, fine. <laughs> which is, I almost feel bad saying because everyone is like, oh, I'm so miserable. Oh, I haven't gotten outside. And I'm like, you know, I never fucking go outside. So this is perfect for me. I just wish everybody else wasn't having such a hard time and complaining so vocally about it. <laughs> it makes me feel bad for being just fine inside. I was made for life. this moment. <laughs> made for it. I'm like, let's have quarantine all the time. Except I know the economy will collapse or whatever, so that's like stupid to say, but indoors. I've been quarantining since, you know, I was in diapers. So I'm I'm into it. it. It must be a little odd though, as a period of like launching a book. Does it feel like you're sort of in this weird void? <laughs> it so it's it's hard and like don't weep for me, but it feels frivolous to be like, hey, I know you're locked inside your house. I know the dog and the cat are fighting each other. I know that you're gonna get divorced in two weeks because you can't stand you didn't know you're going to be trapped with your partner like literally and you realize that you hate them uh, but please buy this book i so it's a, i just am glad that it's a like joke book because at the very least i can be like look if you get it it'll make you laugh and you'll forget that tickle in your chest or, you know what I mean? It'll stop you from panicking every time, like you, your cheeks feel a little warm. Um, so I'm glad I didn't write like a serious, not that I'm smart enough to, but I didn't write like a serious book because that would be impossible to sell right now. I'm also glad I didn't write like a dystopian, everybody gets sick book because that would be hard. Be but brutal. it does feel a little like, Sorry to be selling you a book when everyone is dying. <laughs> it's so dumb. It's so dumb. But like, what am I gonna not sell it? No. It's also kind of a manual for how to live in these very anxious and yeah. uh, quarantiny times. Yes. I hopefully people will read it and be like, oh, you know. I'm okay. There's a person over there who like 
can't walk to the mailbox like on her own house without being crippled with anxiety. So I'm doing all right. I mean, maybe, maybe it, it's a, it's a hopeful book for people who are less anxious than I am. Yeah. I think, I think that's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> Let, let's start with that opening essay though. I mean, I think it's one of the funniest pieces in the book, which is very funny beginning to end. Um, where did the idea for you providing your own beauty routine come from? <laughs> so, so with every book I try to, uh, okay, that's, that's overstanding and it makes it seem like I actually have a plan, which I don't. Okay. Um, but with every, I always think of like how to introduce myself to someone who's never read my stuff before. Um, and so like there's the bachelorette essay in the yellow book and then mm -hmm. I can't remember what introduces me to, but I was like, how can I tell people about myself without like being an asshole and being like, hi, nice to meet you. Um, and so I do get truly like three times a week, uh, a newsletter, or, like a profile that's like, Hey, meet, you know, meet, I, I can't even think. Meet Alexis. <laughs> you know, she's a she's an account manager at so and so, and this is what she does all day. And then it's someone who's like too beautiful, who doesn't eat carbs, and like wants to tell you about all their soaps. And I fucking love that. And I'm like, no one. First of all, even if someone asked me if they could, I would not allow them into this cat-filled uh, gay home. <laughs> I'd be like, would you want to look at all these books that I have, but don't read? Sure. <laughs> right um, behind you. <laughs> like all these books back here. The ones behind me are cookbooks at least. So like oh, I can yeah. get away with not reading them, but I don't cook from them. Um, <laughs> but so I was like, I, I love that. I want to do it. I also like think I'm a moron for loving that. And I'm always trying to like, make fun of things and also make fun of myself. So I thought like, what better way than to do a thing that I love, but also point out that like a person who eats pizza all the time cannot, it would be unhealthy. Like the surgeon general would be like, mm, you gotta take this off the internet. You asked her, she told you she does what every day? <laughs> you know? Be like, mm, no, that much acidity. No, no, this is unhealthy. Take this off. Take this down, Glossier. So, <laughs> so this is my way to do that without doing it. Mm. You're also sort of presenting like this alternate look at the life of, and I think it's safe to say, successful writer, New York yeah. Times bestseller, critically acclaimed. You're, yeah. you're well, I always want people to understand that like success just really looks like pajamas and never going outside. You know how people like someone will have something good happen for them and then you see like their Instagram is all like Hollywooded up and it's like yes. girl you were in one indie movie to like stop you still live with your mom you know <laughs> and like that's fine but I just want to show that like you know our house is falling apart. So yes, <laughs> New York Times bestseller, but also no doorknob on this bathroom. Both can be true. Both, <laughs> yeah. both can be true. Yes. In this book, uh, at the same time, it's safe to say you're a little, I think, happier uh, as yeah. a character than you were in your previous books. Mm -hmm. Because you, your work is autobiographical, talk a little bit about how you have evolved and how your life has evolved sort of in tandem with your writing. Yeah, so I left my job that I worked for forever and moved to Michigan uh, after I got, well, we got married and then like the next day I went back home to Chicago and was like, thanks for that health insurance, girl. Um, but I eventually moved to Michigan to live with uh, my wife. And it's, you know, what a difference it makes to not be in customer service all day, uh -huh. every day and not be filled with like an impotent rage because people are yelling at me and I can't yell back. Um, so like in general, I just happier because I don't have to deal with the public anymore, which is 
nice. And then with my with the book, I just wanted to, I mean, some feedback that I have gotten more than once from people is like, whoa, I really loved your book, but that whole thing about your mom dying, what a bummer. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm sad, huh? Um, so this time I was like, nothing sad has happened, knock on wood, nothing sad's happened. So I was like, what if I just did like funny stories and like comedy bits and just like tried to put a nice thing out that's like fun all the way through. And so it was, it was intentional this time. I mean, not that I tackle a lot of deep, you know, subjects all the time, but I just wanted, even the things I touch on, I just always wanted like, find the nugget of absurdity or like the just what is the funny thing that I can dig out of that situation. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to do like a straight through make people laugh kind of book. Did you find that easier or more challenging than your other books? Uh, easier, easier, especially because I mean, when you're digging through all your sad memories, like it's hard not to get like sort of, you know, bummed out. Also, when you write about sad stuff, especially when it happens to you, you have to do a lot of like reassuring people that you're okay and like they're okay. And <laughs> that's exhausting. So it was good to just like do a fun thing. I think the hardest thing was the first two books I had a full-time job while writing them. And so it was like a fun outlet to come home and like kind of, you know, spit, like vomit everything out. Um, but this book, writing the book was my job. And just like with your job, I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I hate this. <laughs> this is, oh, I'm supposed to get up and then write all day. I'm not fucking doing that shit. So uh, my editor will tell you, she's very nice, but I think if you pressed her, she would tell you that some things were turned in late and other things were like pulling teeth, but only because like, I just wasn't used to having this be uh, the only thing I had to do, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> so it was late. <laughs> and yeah. could get I wish, I wish. I wish, you know, they give you a long time, right? Like yeah. they give you months. And I wish I was a person who like wrote it at the beginning and then took time to read things and fix them. But I'm not like, I would get the like, you have a month to get this done. And like, you have 12 things to turn in. And I'd be like, hmm, now's a good time to start working, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and every time without fail every time I would get something back like marked up and I'd be like like was I asleep when I sent this in like what <laughs> sort of like state of delirium was I in and why did I waste six months watching like Young and the Restless when I could have been doing this six months of Young and the Restless I mean any literally anything to not write <laughs> anything anything you call it a joke book, but I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit. I mean, you always have a real knack for weaving pretty serious topics into your work. And in this one as well, particularly in the both gross and poignant Girls Gone Mild, which I, <laughs> given that the book is just out, I won't go too deep into it. But I'm just curious about when you are writing about stuff that is more personal or serious, um, how do you find threading that line? I don't ever think about the audience. I, I only think about like one person reading it. So I, if I only think about my editor's name is Maria, if I only think about Maria reading it, then it doesn't matter. I can write anything about thing, but the minute I think about, you know, 20 people reading it or like, 2,000 people reading it, then it's like, oh, is that a smart thing to say? And like, luckily for me, my brain, I have a, there's something in there or something not in there as it were <laughs> that like 
keeps me from thinking about people reading it. And I just get it out without without hesitation and then send it to her. And then once it's to her, it's like no take backs. You know, she's like, oh no, we're putting in this extremely detailed thing about your uh, anus in here. Yeah, it's going in. Uh, she told me the book was not as gross and she told me it needed to be grosser. Wow. Yeah. So some of that, some of that, there's a, what's that hysterical? Some of the stuff about <laughs> my uterus was judged uh-huh. up because she was like, mm, this could be more disgusting. <laughs> but yeah, if I don't think about people reading it, I can just say anything. All I have to do is get the one draft down and then it feels like, okay, all right, no one's going to see this. Oh, my editor is going to see it and maybe some people at the publisher and then bam, six months later, the all of vintage has read it and like early readers have read it and then you can't go back. It's out there. Do you feel like now that you've gone so gross that you have this certain brand (laughs) that you have to live up to? Yes. Yeah, I, yes, yeah, (laughs) yes. No, I should just stop there. Yes, I feel like I can't. I also, too, am, like, wishing for more gross things to happen. I'm like, I'm like, what? what's this weird thing my body's doing? Is that something I can tell other people about? Like, no, gross, my body. There's not a whole lot of poop in this book, and I've been very poop-centric. That's because my Crohn's is, knock on wood again, doing pretty well. Uh, And I've stopped eating gluten, which I didn't want that to help, but it helped. Um, Unfortunately. now I'm just like, you know what I could use? You know what my art could use? Another bowel obstruction. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I do, like, gross is... My thing, I always like, I I do, I know it doesn't seem like it, but I do try to go right up to the line. I have a line, doesn't seem like I have a line, but I have a line where that I don't cross into like being unreadable. I think Mm -hmm. I come right up to it. (laughs) Some people would say I cross, I cross their personal gross line, but for me, there is a line. (laughs) I, I mean, uh, I saw, somebody tagged me, this was a while ago, in a picture on Instagram, a person had taken it, she was a librarian, a person had taken Meaty out from the library and wrote like a comment card and was like, this book is <laughs> disgusting. Oh my God. And I was like, okay, she's not wrong. Repost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely did. I was like, this is the best endorsement my work has ever gotten. Thanks, bitch. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, so set the scene for me on when you first knew you had a real gift for, for writing gross. Oh, I, what was my first gross thing? I think, so when I had, when I started, I started my blog around the same time that I was first diagnosed with Crohn's and like I had had this episode where I was in the hospital for two weeks and it truly, all the tests you have to have to figure out what your bowel disease is are disgusting. They're disgusting. And there was one point like four days into this hospital visit where I had an NG tube and that's a tube that goes up your nose and down into your stomach and they suck all the contents of your stomach out, which is so fun. The nurse came in to pull out the tube and I don't know, something went, it wasn't as smooth as it could have been. And she ended up like spilling stomach acid, like down the front of the hospital gown And I, and she was like really apologetic. And I was like, this is disgusting, but this is also very funny. I mean, like, you know, provided I don't die at the end of this, this is going to be really hilarious. So I started writing about all 
that stuff. I didn't know anyone else who was going through it. And so it just, and again, like even when bad things happen, I can immediately like find the one piece of it that's funny. And it's like, yeah, the hospital was terrible, but this, I got blasted in the face with my own stomach acid. Like what's funnier than that? So I just started writing about that stuff. I think just as a release, because I didn't have any answers. Um, And also, I'm sure there's a part of me that was like, this makes me interesting. (laughs) I'm like, I don't know anybody else who's had this happen. (laughs) I'm cool. So I just started writing about that. And like people responded to it. And so I'm like a you know, a seal or whatever. Like if you keep throwing me the fish, I'll keep, you know, going up to catch them. And if you keep applauding my butthole stories, I will keep telling you about that. It feels weird to ask this with in response to that answer, but is there anything that you find off limits for writing? Any experiences, any particular feelings maybe um well yes so i don't there there are some ways in which i try not to this one is like less fun i try not to you know i some people i don't think even know like i have three sisters and i don't write about them a lot because like Mm -hmm. they're alive and they have kids and I would never want, you know, I still see them sometimes. I would never want them to be like, okay, bitch, that thing you said, let's fight. Um, Cause I can't fight. So, (laughs) so I try not to, I try when I talk about my family to be sort of unsparing and how like bad it was growing up but I Mm -hmm. try to at least protect them a little bit and mostly talk about our the failures of our parents which were many um another thing I don't I have some friendships that I've lost that I like are were really painful to me more painful than breakups and I don't ever really get into that. I try not to write about anything that if I did a reading or someone saw me on the street, I wouldn't want to answer. Like if they asked me about it, I wouldn't be able to talk about it. Cause I don't think that's fair to like put something in a book and then be like, <laughs> I know that's chapter seven, but please don't ask me about that. <laughs> like that to me is crazy yeah. if I write about it and you want to know about it, then I'll talk about it. So like some of my like friendships that I don't have anymore, I don't ever write about those because that like feels bad to me. But pretty much anything else is on the table. Like if I've processed it, it can go, it can go in a book. Oh, and I try to be respectful of other people. Like, so if, even if it's a, an incredible experience that would be hilarious if someone else was involved and they don't want me to write about it. I don't about it, hmm. which is sad. That's a good rule of thumb, you though. Know? I try. I don't want. I mean, books are forever. Yeah, it's true. And I just don't want anyone to be like, "Listen, you fucked me over by telling that story, and here's <laughs> proof of it that I can hold over your head." Forever and ever, I don't want to do. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but like anything else, really, anything that's happened to me, pretty much fair game. Hmm. One of the more poignant pieces, I think, in this book, uh, you were mentioning about growing up a little bit, is um, time capsule, mm-hmm. uh, where you sort of structure it like a mixtape, and you write uh, that mixtapes were the love language of my youth. Mm-hmm. What was it like crafting that? Because it seemed like it was a little different key for you. Uh, yeah, I don't really get nostalgic too often, but music for me is, I mean, not that I'm the only one, but like there are some songs that take me like right back to my 
locker freshman year. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. standing next to my locker freshman year, I can like see people walking down the halls. Like those songs, like the things that you listened to when you were in your teens and early 20s are like, they just imprint on you forever. And so I wanted to write, I mean, it's my dream now that like I could make someone a mixtape and be like, here are all these songs I put together and now you have to figure out how I feel about you based on my (laughs) arbitrary song choices. Um, But I just wanted to write like, because I mean, everybody had a whole teens, but also there were like, for me at least, there were like some sweet parts too and some parts that I remember and um, and think back on fondly. And I still listen to all that shit. So I still have those feelings all the time. Like I am always listening to Tori, <laughs> Tori Amos and Ani DeFranco. So I'm like, you know, steeped in it. And I just wanted to write like kind of a love letter to that time. Hmm. I think it really comes through. It's really, it through. it's really beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, now I want to get to the quarantining. <laughs> yes. What are you watching right now? What are you reading right now? If you are reading at all, um, how are you? How are you spending your days? Well, quarantine is just like a regular. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Is it even really a worthy question? <laughs> a regular day for me, but but the difference is my wife is home, um, Ooh, which yeah. she's usually not. So when I'm not trying to avoid uh, her murderous gaze, no, I'm just kidding. We are getting along. Um, <laughs> you know, <I> <laughs> we, we just finished, we just finished the outsider on oh, HBO, yeah. which is great. We started watching little that. fires everywhere, mm. which is really good. Um, what else? Uh, I just started catching up on the new season of The Voice, which is, I mean, that Nick Jonas is so cute. It like, like causes me physical pain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're watching, have you ever watched that show Evil? It's on CBS. Oh yeah, with um, Mike Coulter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Another beautiful dream boat. That sh- that show is so fucking weird, but it's also like really good. Yeah, I, like I was really good. into The Good Wife, so like the kings are. I mean, they totally. can do they can do no wrong. Um, also, like I'm your grandmother. I still watch Survivor. Uh, uh, me too. I winners I love at war. Survivor. I love Survivor. Um, what else? I think that's, we're going to watch that movie, The Invisible Man, tonight. I'm here for this (laughs) on-demand theater movies coming to your house. I was like, yes, we're going to watch that, The Hunt, what Emma, whatever else came out. Like, I have big movie plans. Um, Books, I just got, it just came out today, this book, The Herd by Mm. Andrea Bartz. And then... I just started like one chapter in New Waves by Kevin Nguyen. Mm -hmm. Very excited about that. I'm trying to think. So you do read a little. You know, what'd you say? So you do read a little. I do. Oh, (laughs) I'm a tiny. You know what? I just finished, although it's too early to talk about it because no one else can get it. But have you read Luster by Raven? Oh. I don't think I'm allowed to say. I definitely don't think I'm allowed to say anything. Okay. Well, I was a member of the media. (laughs) Oh, oh, that's right. Okay. Well, people, I'm just a regular person who happened to get (laughs) her hands on an early copy, and that shit is good as hell. (laughs) It's so good. Okay. We won't talk about it. I don't want to entrap you, but if you guys care about my uneducated opinion, it's very good. That's good. I hope she blows up. That's a problem with getting books early just because I read them and I'm like, hey, y'all read this. And then they're like, August. And then they forget about it when it's August. Yes. So 
I'm gonna hold my fire until closer to release time, and then I'm gonna remind everybody to read it because it's good. Mm. Well, Sam, you also have many friends who are interested in what you're doing during quarantine. Uh, we do not have a physical audience here, obviously, but we did uh, solicit some Twitter questions, oh, and yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a few at you, starting okay. with an easy one. Okay. Again, this are probably just like. The question is, what are your favorite quarantine snacks? But I imagine the question is, what are your favorite snacks every day would also apply here? Well, okay, this is gonna be an asshole answer because I just had to, like a few months ago, switch to not eating gluten, mm -hmm. not for vanity reasons, but for digestive reasons. And like, I was hoping it wouldn't work and I could go back to like eating regular bread, but it worked and now I'm like, shit. So my gluten-free snacks, I'm sorry, popcorners, <laughs> they are flat flavored popcorn chips. They're way more delicious than I'm making them sound. The jalapeno cheddar are chef's kiss. <laughs> also, Tate's gluten-free cookies, if you're a cookie person. Those are really Again, good. the key to not eating whatever it is you can't eat, take this from an IBS pro, is you just have to push the memory of what real food tastes like out of your mind. You just, you can't think about a regular cookie or brownie. You have to, like men in black the memory of that out of your head and then just go in with a clean slate and then it's like okay this chickpea pasta <laughs> it'll do not gonna kill me um so yeah tate's cookies and those popcorners are my quarantine jam nice they're so good uh, the next one how much time do you spend watching judge mathis every week and how many of them do you decide, decide not to write about in an email on average? Oh. You should probably provide a little context for this for anyone yes. who is not familiar with this particular habit. So I write a newsletter. So I had started writing a newsletter that was about like books and food, and then I fell off writing it, <laughs> of course. So then one day I was watching Judge Mathis, which I've been a fan of for like 10 years. I've been to like six or seven tapings, which for a person who doesn't like to go anywhere is a lot. A deal. <laughs> so, so one day I was watching his show and like I tweeted, if I wrote a recap of Judge Mathis, would anyone want to read it? And then people, like more people than I expected responded yes. And then I was like, okay, maybe this is what I can do with that newsletter I don't use. And so I started sending it out and it was just like 20 people at first. Now it's up to like 5,000 people, which is insanity. So every day, every day I watch an episode, well, okay. There's usually, so see, this is, people are going to click off. There's usually like four, four cases, three or four cases per episode. And I take one of those cases and then recap it and do it in this newsletter that I send out free. I just do it because I like it. Um, <laughs> and I, so I was just in Chicago for work. So I fell off on my newsletter a little because I had like actual work to do, so now I'm getting back into it. But I would say I probably watch at least three hours of it a week. It's it's too much. It's a sickness. It's too much. And then I I try not to write about any of the cases that are sad because I'm making fun of it and making fun right. of myself. I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't, sometimes I'll get tricked into like watching a paternity one and I'm like, oh no, 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 I can't. <laughs> no one needs to hear my jokes about whether or not this 20 year old woman is actually this guy's daughter. I don't ever want to do that. So I try to, I get the ones that are sad or depressing, but I recap all the rest. 
I have a backlog because I was working. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see. I got to catch up. But yeah, like three hours a week. That's it's a too much. very nice, thorough answer to that question. <laughs> And I would expect nothing less for that question. No, I, I said too much. I know, I know. I um, too next one, I do want to preface it by saying uh, in this new book, you write about uh, the experience of going to Hollywood to write um, on mm. Trill, mm -hmm. uh, the adaptation of your friend Lindy West's book. Mm -hmm. And one thing I love about that chapter is that you ask many questions that I feel like are, are normal questions to ask for someone moving to Hollywood for this particular reason, like mm -hmm. what is my new grocery store? Do I have to drink oat milk? Is there a <laughs> lift stipend? Like big important questions. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say as a reader, I appreciated that. Anyway. Uh, I the just want you to know that I want everyone, anyone reading my thing to know that I did not go to Hollywood and feel like part of Hollywood. I went to Hollywood and was like, um, do y'all eat meat here or what? <laughs> <laughs> so this question is, what okay. is the status on the series film adaptation, series or film adaptation of Meaty, which is your um, debut book? And how is that coming along? Well, this corona has stopped everyone in their tracks. So it's currently on pause, but it's in development at Comedy Central. And I wrote the pilot and rewrote it like 37 times because that's what you <laughs> do. Like you get lots of notes and you it will probably be rewritten again. Um, and so I think we get to, I think we're, we're at the, we paused right before we got to the casting stage. And I think we're going to get to shoot the pilot. And then we'll see. I think you, I still, see, here's the thing. I still don't 100% know what I'm doing. So I think we get to shoot the pilot and then Comedy Central watches the pilot. And then if they like it, they go write some more episodes and we'll let you shoot the rest. And if they hate it, I don't know, I get a firing squad or something and I never get to make anything again. So <laughs> that's where we're at. We're stalled out right before the casting process has begun. TBD on yeah. needy. <laughs> yeah. If we get to make it though, I right. will say, speaking of being disgusting, it is disgusting. <laughs> and if you get to see it, I mean, they really let me be me, take or uh, take that to mean what it's, it's horrifying, but it's also very funny. It's just like hard comedy, which is what I like. I just want people pooping their pants and, you know, crashing into things. And they let me, they, they really encouraged me to be that person. So Excellent. if we get to make it, it's going to be good and gross. Excellent. <laughs> uh, next Twitter question. Favorite Chris Maloney, Oz, SVU, or Wet Hot? Again, this is a, a particular interest of yours. Mm. I am going to say his last couple of seasons of SVU. Good Lord. He... <laughs> There's there was definitely a Stabler got thick period like where he he came on screen and it was like oh has his neck tripled in size like does he have a barrel under his shirt those seasons of SVU hottest Maloney that dude is so hot give me a break he's yes late stage SVU Maloney. <laughs> Late stage SVU. Got it. <laughs> Which, I mean, this may be the same answer, but uh, we'll, so we'll go with a different one. Which celebrity would you want to self isolate with, but you know it would go south? On which we, you know it would go south for a, over a fortnight, over two. Okay, years. this is going to be the most controversial thing I would probably ever say. Wow. Tom Cruise. Oh. <laughs> See, Sorry. I 
love Tom Cruise. I can't talk about the religion. I don't know enough about the religion. I know it's bad. Whatever. I don't think he is the most charismatic. He's like our final movie star. I mean him and Brad Pitt and Leah. He's just charismatic and he seems a nice person. And I'm sure he would make me be in the Sea Org or whatever that shit is called. I probably shouldn't even say that lest they come to my fucking house because they heard me say it. But I he just seems like he would be upbeat and happy and yeah, he would make the quarantine like he'd probably like try to get me to do jumping jacks or whatever. And then <laughs> that's when it would fall apart when he's like, okay, Sam, we've been quarantined for, you know, days while we do some burpees, then like we would probably fight to the death. But until then he's got like that infectious energy. That's the thing. I'm like a, a negative low energy person but I really enjoy high energy people and he is like, the highest energy person. He's really high energy. Yeah. Yeah. I would want to watch him do stuff while I sit very still and do nothing. <laughs> um, last question comes from me uh, okay. in this, in this, uh, era of self isolation. Obviously we can't see any people. People cannot come to our events. Who do you hope? is watching this right now? Oh, well, hmm. oh man. I mean, I'm gonna pick a famous person. There are many regular people I hope are watching because I miss them, but like, I don't need to shout out a regular no. person. What if I was like, Joe, <laughs> that's our secret. <laughs> Celebrities are more fun. <laughs> um, I would say, Probably Forrest Whitaker, who is my favorite celebrity of all time. I just think he seems so nice and I love his work. He's my avatar on Instagram. He always has been. I just really love Forrest Whitaker. So I, I came close. This is so stupid. But this woman I know went to Comic-Con and got to take a picture with him and she held up a copy of my book and then sent it to me like she's next to him holding my book. I mean I almost threw up from happiness um so wow. that's as close as I've gotten so maybe he knows that there's a book with a cat on it that <laughs> some psychotic person who loves him wrote but I would <laughs> I would love for him uh, to watch. That's like your or, I've made it evidence. Yes. I, he doesn't <laughs> even need to watch this. And I like have agents for this probably, but I'd love to like send him a book. I should like, my agent's going to be like, this is not what I get paid to do, <laughs> but I should ask him if he can get him one. Wild that this okay. started with the hope that Forrest Whitaker is watching this right now. <laughs> oh God. I mean, I if I knew he would be, I would have like worn a nicer shirt. <laughs> you never know. You never know. He's like, oh, happy to see old sweatshirt over there. Love me. <laughs> I'm sorry, Forrest. Well, the book is Wow. No, thank you. Thank you so much, Sam, for joining us. Thank you for having me. This was great. Absolutely. This is super fun. The book is now uh, available for purchase. Get it, um, get it remotely. It's, and can... it's cheap. It's not going to cost you $30. Don't have to go to the store. You can order it online. No, it can get delivered right to your door. And practice your Samantha Irby quarantining <laughs> habits safely. My social distancing is 10 feet. So, wow. you know. <laughs> That's healthy. That's healthy. <laughs> yes. All right. Watch, now that I said that, I'm going to get that shit. Okay. <laughs> and on that note, uh, stay tuned for more talks with 92nd Street Wine EW. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>